Hey there, beautiful people. How you doing? Your buddy Phil here. Welcome back to the show, the PMP Exam Radio Show. Whether you're tuning in for the first time or you've been riding this PMP journey with me for a while, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for every time you've taken that extra few seconds to send in a comment or to smash the like button. I know how intense and overwhelming the PMP exam can be, and I just wanted to let you know you are not alone. We're in this together. That is why I've dedicated thousands and thousands of minutes of my time to create great content for you on this platform. Today, we're going into the three pillars of the PMP exam. Yet another journey with your buddy Phil across the people, the process, and the business domain. But we're not just going to skim over them. We're going to connect with them. Because here's the truth, my friends. Success in project management on the PMP exam is not about memorizing frameworks. It's not about memorizing the 49, the 10, and the 5. And while those are important, instead, it's about understanding how these concepts shape our experiences, our teams, and our businesses. So, my friends, let's take this journey step by step, heart by heart. Let's jump into the very first segment, the people domain. This is all about building relationships and building success together. So let's start with something that hits close to home, humans. It's more than just managing teams. It's about building relationships, whether you're working with stakeholders Mentoring a team or navigating through conflicts. You know as well as I do that people are at the core of every project. We're working the project with people, for people. Think about it. Every decision, every milestone that we hit or miss is impacted by the relationship that we've built with the people around us. And as you study for this exam, remember that understanding the people domain will greatly elevate your game. Understanding motivations, emotions, and even resistance is what separates a good project manager from a great one. So when you're reviewing topics like team development, conflict management, leadership styles, don't just think of them as exam material. I want you to think about them as tools for the real world, things that can help you become the leader that people trust, rely on, and look up to. I remember when I was leading a particularly challenging project, the timelines were tight, we were under heavy pressure, and honestly, what got us through wasn't a perfect Gantt chart, it wasn't cost analysis, it was trust. It was knowing the strengths and the weaknesses of each team member and leading with empathy. And that's the kind of impact the people domain will have on your PMP journey and your career as a whole. So let's jump straight into the people domain content outline where the PMI has the tasks and the enablers. As we go through this, it's going to be very quick and I may be speaking a lot quicker, but we're going to tackle every task and I'm going to anchor it back to a concept that you need to know. I will mention a number of things along the way that you may need to listen back to and go check them for yourself. Okay. So let's break them down. Number one, task one is all about managing conflict. When you think about managing conflict, the goal here is not necessarily to solve conflict for people. No, we need to understand that people are able to resolve conflicts under most circumstances themselves if they're given the right guidance, if they're given the right rules of the game. So what we need to do as project managers is ensure that the rules of the game for engaging in conflict, for engaging in conversation towards conflict resolution are well understood. This is where you need to understand the Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument. Avoid or withdraw, smooth or accommodate, compromise or reconcile, force or direct, collaborate or problem solve. These are things you really should know well. Going into task two, lead a team. The true measure of leadership is influence. You need to understand what exactly leadership is. It's about influence. How do you influence? Clear vision, clear mission, supporting diversity and inclusion, understanding that you shouldn't try to lead two people the same way. People are different. So when it comes to leading a team, you've got to understand 
the Hersey Blanchard model. It will give you great perspective. Task three, support team performance. Just makes sense that you as a leader should support the team's performance by recognizing team member growth and development, by determining how to give feedback to the team. Task four is about empowerment. The Agile Manifesto says give the team the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Remember that? Going into the next task, five, ensure team members and stakeholders are adequately trained. This is a no-brainer. You've got to determine the required competencies, allocate resources for training, and you've got to measure training outcomes. Going into task six, it's about building a team. And building a team means you are appraising their skills, you're deducing what is needed, and you are equipping them. You are continuously refreshing the skills of those individuals. Let's move on to task seven. Task seven is address and remove impediments, obstacles, and blockers. An impediment slows you down. It impedes. An obstacle is in your way, but you could go around it. A blocker blocks the entire door. You are stopped in your tracks. What should you do? Aggressively prioritize and go after those impediments. Task eight, negotiate project agreements. When we negotiate project agreements, we must understand that we should seek for a solution that is acceptable to both parties, not a solution for just us alone. We want a solution that appeals to both parties that results in a win-win. That needs to be a mindset and how we're thinking. What does the Agile Manifesto say? It says customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Let's go to number nine. Number nine is all about collaboration. And again, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. You should be thinking hyper. How can we collaborate with our stakeholders? How can we optimize alignment? And how can we build trust? Here, you need to be aware of a few things. Be aware of a stakeholder register and be aware of what I call the SEAM, the Stakeholder Engagement Assessment Matrix. It's very important as a project manager that you emphasize the importance of involving stakeholders early and often. It is also vital that you understand stakeholders have different communication preferences and you need to go deep down into those by stakeholder. There are going to be times when there are some very important stakeholders that you need to spend a ton of time on. And there are times when there are some stakeholders that may not have as much power and influence and not as much interest. And that's okay. But here, this is where you really understand how do we collaborate with our stakeholders. Going into task 10, it's all about building a shared understanding. It's all about transparency. You've got to build a shared vision, use tools to align any understandings that need to be established, and facilitate team discussion and feedback loops. Moving on to task 11, engage and support virtual teams. Here, I would advise that you know the fishbowl window concept. Looking through the fishbowl window, metaphorically speaking, what does that mean? It's in the Agile Practice Guide. It's like a fish looking out of the bowl to its surroundings. This is how we, as humans on the project, connect through virtual communication tools, and we're looking out into the world of the team members that are not geographically located where we are. They're in other regions, but we can look into their world through long-lived video conferencing tools. Number 12, define team ground rules. Here, you need to understand what ground rules are, you need to get buy-in from the team regarding the ground rules. In fact, work them together, document and communicate the rules, and revisit and adjust the rules as necessary. Task 13, it just says mentor relevant stakeholders. It's that simple. There's going to be opportunities that you see for mentoring, and it would be prudent to jump on those opportunities and mentor people who are screaming in their 
facial expressions, their body language, and in the words they choose, they're screaming, I need mentoring. I don't get this thing called agile. You'll know because you'll listen to some of the questions they ask and you'll be like, hmm, that definitely means you need some help with agile or something else. So do keep that in mind. You want to mentor relevant stakeholders and always be on the lookout for opportunities. Number 14 just says promote team performance through the application of EI. So you should understand emotional intelligence, its self-awareness, empathy, and managing emotions. Recognize and manage your emotions. Don't be like a manager of mine who one day in the afternoon got so mad at a stakeholder, he took a glass container and flung it on the wall, shattered into tiny little pieces in a professional environment. Can you believe that? Yeah, we don't want that to happen. So we got to get a hold of our emotions, emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence has been said by PMI. It's been said that it's the ability to bridle our emotions, control our emotions, and be able to influence the emotions of others. That is emotional intelligence. And that concludes the first section. Regarding the emotional intelligence, if you haven't read about Myers-Briggs, highly recommend check out Wikipedia, do a quick search, at least go into the exam with some knowledge. Okay? Moving on to the next domain. The next domain is the process domain. And the very first task just says, execute the project with urgency required to deliver business value. Why is that? Well, if you don't execute urgently and you're executing in a way that is random, that's no good. So why the urgency? Because value needs to be delivered. And it could be critical in some instances, delivering that value. So when it comes to executing with urgency, focus on business value. Prioritize tasks. Big ticket items first. Most critical things first. When you are executing with urgency, you're also bearing in mind things like the cost of delay. If I delay this, what is the cost of me doing that? And also when it comes to risk, the riskier high value items should be done earlier on the project so that there is a probability, a higher probability, that will actually get them done. Let's go to task two, manage communications. Everything to do with communications, make sure it's planned, executed, and effectively monitored and controlled. Going over to task three, assess and manage risk again. Everything regarding risk, plan it, manage it, monitor it. It says assess and manage risks. There's so many topics that we can talk about under task three of process domain. We could talk about the agile approach to risk. We could talk about the predictive approach. We could go into plan risk management, identify risk, perform qualitative risk analysis, perform quantitative risk analysis, plan risk responses, implement risk responses, monitor risk. It's so so many things we could talk about, but I'll allow that to be digested by you. Task four, engage stakeholders. Again, it's a way of saying, make sure you're planning for how to engage the stakeholders and make sure you're engaging them and monitoring the engagement. That's all it's saying. Same for task five, plan and manage budget and resources. Do the same for all of these tasks. In other words, Know how to plan that area and be comfortable with the different flows in every knowledge area. And when I say flows, there's a logical flow of work. Now, we may call it process, but it's still a logical flow of the work. Okay, let's go to task five. It says plan and manage budget and resources. So what is a natural flow of things? You've got to plan overall. How are we going to manage this budget? Then how are we going to put the budget together, right? You've got to plan cost management. You've got to estimate the cost for the itty bitty activities. Then you roll them up into a final total. We call that determine budget. And then you've got to control cost. We do the same for resources. We plan. How are we going to get our resources? 
How are we going to effectively lead? And then we just jump into it and do it. So that's pretty much how all these tasks are, right? Plan and manage schedule. Plan and manage quality of products or deliverables. Plan and manage scope. All of these follow that pattern of plan how to run the knowledge area, then actually do what you planned, manage it, and then monitor it, control it as needed. Okay. So the idea is you follow the 49 processes flow. That was documented in Process Groups of Practice Guide. So when we see things like integrate project planning activities task 9, it makes sense. Because this is saying integrate all the things that came before that we've talked about. Manage this, manage that, plan this, do this. Well, this is the place where everything comes together. It's in this task that we call integrate project planning activities. Task 10, manage project changes. Makes sense. Always ask for the change in formal writing. Do some research, do some analysis, and be sure you understand it. And when you understand it, you then send that change request over to the change control board with your recommendations and they can take a look at it themselves and also come back with their own recommendations or approval or rejection. And that's really what it means when we say plan and manage, manage project changes, task 10. Task 11, plan and manage procurement. Task 12, manage project artifacts. The artifacts you create in the project should be effectively managed. Determine appropriate project methodology, methods and practices, task 13. Task 14, establish project governance structure. Governance is a framework within which authority is exercised. Task 15, manage project issues. Task 16, ensure knowledge transfer for project continuity and task 17. Plan and manage project or phase closure or transitions. And that concludes the process domain. There is so much to go into, but I would really love for you to spend some time understanding, not memorizing, understanding the 49 processes. It will help you greatly in your prep. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the final domain. It's the business domain. Four things to do. Number one plan and manage project compliance. You cannot rely on luck and you cannot ignore compliance clauses. Task two, evaluate and deliver project benefits and value. Value is the net benefit that a customer or end user realizes from a product, service or result. Task three, evaluate and address the external business environment changes for impact on scope. And lastly, task four, support organizational change, assess organizational culture, evaluate the impact of organizational change on your project, and evaluate the impact of your project to the organization. What you're going to find across the board for any question, it follows something that I refer to as a DIGCIV framework. This is based on a framework hidden in a previous PMBOK guide, and I wrote a book on it called DIGCIV. You can actually find this on Amazon, D-I-G-C-I-V. But the framework is whenever you are posed with a problem, always define it first. Break it down into smaller pieces if you need to, but define the problem. Then identify the root cause. Generate alternatives. Choose the best alternative and then implement the alternative and verify that it actually worked, D-I-G-C-I-V. DIGCIV is very helpful because when you get questions on the exam, could be of a tricky nature, you always want to sit back and say, has the definition of the problem been done? Has the root cause been identified? Are the solutions generated sensible? And that's how you can find a lot of information out about 
questions just by following the DIG CIV. When you critically look at a question from a Dixiv standpoint, you find everything up to the point where you are in the question. It just helps you methodically go through, has it been defined? Has it been identified? Any alternatives that make sense? And so on. Thank you very much, my friends, for joining me today. I hope this has been of value to you to get you caught up with your PMP. I know some of you have fallen off the wagon, but I'm hoping today's broadcast helps you put things in perspective. And I hope it will enable you to get back on the wagon and ride till it's done. Okay? Thank you. Take out a few seconds if you haven't already. Smash that like button for me. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.